part of our research was trying to identify what organisms were missing and could we add those organisms back to help restore a healthy microbiome? Or could we target microbes within the gut that were perhaps producing molecules that were then getting into the bloodstream and causing some of this aberrant behavior? Hello, my name is Mike Ward. I'm the head of content at uh, Script and The Pink Sheet. Uh, we're here at BioEurope in Berlin uh, at the, uh, sort of the annual biopartnering meeting that takes place in, in the fall, where biotechs, pharma, um, in investors all get to meet, um, discuss what the new ideas are, uh, trying to do deals, get a sense of what's hot. One of, in recent years, one of the really, really hot areas has in fact been uh, a sort of a re-emergence of the microbiome. This is where sort of the, you know, the impact of, of bacteria that we have in and sometimes on our bodies, how that actually uh, has a, an impact on both illness, wellness, and, 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 and how, we, how we treat ourselves. I'm joined uh, by uh, David uh, Donavidian, who is the CEO of Axial Biotherapeutics. This is a microbiome company that has spun out of Caltech. So, David, thank you very much for joining us. So, you know, a lot of companies, this is a hot area. Um, you know, some people might dismiss it as, as a fad. Right. Um, what is it in the sort of the microbiome space that you think that you're going to be able to uh, capture some attention? Absolutely. Thanks, Mike, for having me. I mean, the biggest thing we are basing a lot of our knowledge on is the really groundbreaking work out of our co-founder's lab, Dr. Sarkis Masmanian, which has shown in preclinical models that the gut microbiome, we feel from the data that we have to date, if not contributes, causes a lot of the diseases associated with central nervous system disorders. And this is really based on this whole idea of the gut-brain axis and this two-way communication between the brain and the gut. So most of us will feel anxious or nervous, we get butterflies in our stomach. That's a one-way communication from the brain to the gut. We now know that communication goes the other way as well. And part of that communication is driven by gut bacteria. So we're really harnessing a better understanding of those gut bacteria to develop drugs to treat diseases where people thought primarily originated in the brain, where they may actually originate in the gut. Okay, so, so, how, so how does that work? I mean, what? what do you to identify, is it particularly gut bacteria? Absolutely. Like so, we, so what we do, so where we start from is we look at certain CNS diseases, yeah. central nervous system disorders, that have a gut pathology. So interestingly, uh, autism, for example, 40 to 60% of children with autism suffer from GI distress, such as abdominal cramps, diarrhea, bloating, and constipation. Well, what's driving those abdominal symptoms? We've seen in epidemiological studies that a lot of it is driven by a gut microbiome that looks very different than a microbiome that you and I may have. So part of our research was trying to identify what organisms were missing and could we add those organisms back to help restore a healthy microbiome? Or could we target microbes within the gut that were perhaps producing molecules that were then getting into the bloodstream and causing some of this aberrant behavior and finding ways to fine tune those bad acting microbes. Okay, so, so, so where are you in the progress? Because you sort of say, well, okay, there was this work that was coming out of the, uh, the of Caltech, Caltech lab. Correct. Um, <clears throat> what, the company was founded, what, 12 months ago? Just under 12 months ago. We've made a lot of progress. So when we first launched the company, we had a, a preclinical asset focused on ameliorating these gut symptoms, but also reducing these microbial metabolites by introducing a beneficial bacterial strain. Since launch, we've also identified a small molecule that works on the same mechanism, but very different in terms of its profile. So we'll be heading into the clinic next year with one or two of these assets around autism. And what's really unique about our, our, our profile is we'll be focusing on improvements in gut symptomology and also changes in these microbial metabolites. So not once have I mentioned looking at behavioral endpoints as our primary outcome. We'll measure those. But what we really want to show is our hypothesis that the gut microbiome is driving a lot of the pathology in the gut and also the aberrant behavior in autism. So what discussions have you had with regulators 
to that say that they would accept these sort of endpoints? Right, so part of it is we are, uh, in terms of our approach, and we have another program in Parkinson's, what I'll get to, but in terms of our approach, we're not beholden to one type of modality, such as a live bacterial intervention. We also have a small molecule approach, and we all know that's much more of a straightforward path to the clinic because it's been proved and tested for, for many, many years. But with the live biotherapeutic, what we're thinking about is engaging with regulators to find a way to ensure that we can get into a patient population to test our hypothesis. So we started those discussions proactively with regulators to be able to commence those trials next year. Right. Okay. Um, and then you sort of say that you have another program that's focusing on Parkinson's. And Parkinson's, totally different. It's a real cool concept. So most people understand Parkinson's disease emanates in the brain or believe that's where it starts and you see motor dysfunction, such as trembling, gait, and a stone face. And then what you tend to see in patients is a buildup of a protein called alpha-synuclein. And you see large amounts of alpha-synuclein in discrete parts of the brain that causes this motor impairment. But what's very interesting is you see non-motor symptomology start years or decades before you see some of the motor symptoms such as constipation, loss of smell, trouble swallowing, and trouble sleeping. And a lot of those um, symptoms are associated with the enteric nervous system and not the central nervous system. So what we believe at Axial is that Parkinson's disease may actually emanate in the gut via bacteria and travel through the vagus nerve and then cause alpha-synuclein aggregation in specific parts of the brain. Okay, and, and, and where you are on that program? So that program we've also published preclinical results where we've shown that when you take a microbiome from a Parkinson's patient and a normal control, and transplant those into mice that are predisposed to Parkinson's but don't have Parkinson's, we've demonstrated that only the mice that receive the microbiomes from the Parkinson's patients actually developed the same symptomology as the Parkinson's patients and showed aggregation of this protein in the brain, which is amazing, only with the introduction of a gut microbiome. So since we published this paper in December of last year at the Mazamanian lab, we've now advanced that program. Now we're identifying changes or differences in the gut microbiomes of Parkinson's patients and normal healthies in targeting whether to add bacteria that would be beneficial to Parkinson's patients or try to ameliorate by perhaps targeting bacteria that are over enriched in the Parkinson's patients that may be driving motor symptoms. So how is the company being funded to date? So we closed our Series A financing December of last year, just $19 million. It was led by the fund I work at, Longwood Fund, as well as Domain Partners were the two lead investors in the fund. Right, okay. And, and that was going to give you how much runway? That gives us plenty of runway to get through our clinical development programs, and we expect to be into the clinic, as I said, next year. Right, okay. Um, so you know, at a meeting like this, as I mentioned in my introduction, um, you know, biotechs would be looking either potentially for your pharmaceutical partners um, or are looking for investors. You know, what, what, what brings you to Berlin? Sure, absolutely. So it's both, and it's always about getting the, the word out about Axial. So since we launched the company in January of last year, we had groups that wanted to actually participate in our financing, and they didn't have an opportunity to do that. So those conversations are still ongoing. And as it relates to potential partnerships, my background was in partnerships at a large pharma before this, so it's never too early to start those discussions, and we continue to have those. And as you mentioned, BioEurope is a great forum to do that. So where we are at Axial is we're, we're very focused on delivering on those products in the clinic next year, but we're open to bringing on great investors and as well as potential partners to help us get there faster. And the, and the, the new investors, would that be sort of um, an add-on to the original Series A, or would that be a Series B financing? It could be, could be either, depending on the type of investors we're thinking about, but we're open to bringing on great investors at this point. Okay, okay. Uh, David, thanks very much for, for, for stopping by. Thank you very much. Cheers. Take care, Michael.